Okay. Um, we The select board is now back in session um, and we will do our Leary Lot presentation uh, with Jeff Squires from the Berkshire Design Group. And um, Jeff, if you wanna come, come up and have your presentation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here again. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is what the I think, third time we've been um, here before you just to present updates and discuss um, project status of the Leary lot. Um, I think, you know, just in terms of um, project, you know, overall updates and status, Chris, if you um, when you get a chance, if you want to bring up um, sort of the, the opening slide. Sure. Uh, we've we've for the most part settled on a design, um, a layout of the of the parking lot. Um, we are including that second access road out um, onto um, onto Elm, and um, I know there's still a little bit of ongoing discussion about you know one way or two way and in or out, and so you know at least in terms of where the design sits and our recommendation at this point would be to show a road that minimally satisfies fire department and safe and emergency access requirements so in that case it's an 18 foot wide uh road um which can facilitate two way traffic if necessary it's tight but you can fit two cars in an 18 foot wide road it can also function very easily as a one way so it leaves it open for discussion i don't think it hinders the design or the process at all um, but that's, you know, obviously something to point out um, just to allow us to move forward. Um, but aside from that, I think the design, um, when when Chris gets this up, um, you know, really just um, sort of further reinforces where we left off with the sidewalk um, separating the property okay. on the south side of the Leary lot and, and the other. Um, Can I ask a question about just the, the question about the access road? Yes. We have 25 feet what could be put in there could you put a two a two lane access road and sidewalks or would you not be able to put a sidewalk in there doesn't have to be on both sides just one nope, side you could, there's certainly enough room for a sidewalk so uh it, what it's like a four foot wide or is it we, three we'd foot? probably recommend a, at least a five foot wide sidewalk okay with a you know with some sort of curb to, to right. make sure that there's some separation there Right, but there's certainly enough room to do that. And then, could the road be twenty? I mean, could you totally use the twenty-five foot? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's possible. Yes, I think I think the twenty feet pushes it a little bit, just in terms of you know, if you really confine to the boundaries of the the property line, right? You know, some of the nuances of grading and getting all that to work. I think you know, it, it gets tight, but there's certainly enough room for, um, you know, for uh, an 18 foot wide road, we can look at, you know, we can look at 20. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, the internet right now is the slowest I've ever seen it. So it's taken a minute to pull up your presentation. Well, that's fine. I've got, a, I've got it here too, if that helps, but yeah. All right. I'm trying to load it right now from email, but Joe, it's, sure. uh, it's chugging along. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I guess the bottom line is we do have some flexibility with respect to that roadway. So we can certainly look at, you know, trying to maximize that entire space. Mm -hmm. um, and I know some of the discussions have, have been with Hampshaw and, and trying to understand what their intentions are for that property. Right. Um, and so um, we were trying to leave just a little bit of room there to, to allow that to happen. There we go. Perfect. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, I will share the screen so the people joining us online can take a look at that. All right, all yours, Jeff. So yeah, this um, again, just uh, in the upper left hand, um, obviously the the site, um, the existing EV chargers and accessible spaces um, coming off of North Main Street. Um, we've got a small picnic area with some picnic tables, um, tree box filters, and sidewalk um, just to the left of that. Um, and then continuing along, we've got a you know continuous sidewalk separating the the properties. And connect, connecting up to um, you know the the future beer garden and improvements at, at Berkshire Brewing, um, 
and then a sidewalk continuing to the east uh, in response to uh, Tim again to your question. This shows an 18 foot wide road. You can envision a, a narrow band of sidewalk adjacent to that um, exit on, on the Elm. And so there's some room to, to, to fit that. Um, there are a couple of rain gardens that we are including, um, again, as part of the MVP grant and stormwater requirements um, that uh, um, Chris will speak to um, in a little bit. But um, yeah, I think this is generally just highlighting and reinforcing um, some of the previous discussions. And how many spaces are there? Um, oh, geez, I should have added these up. Um, I think we were looking at 56. I think that's around where this sits. Yeah, I didn't do a final count after this, and I, I apologize for that, but I, I I can certainly count those up. I think we are in and around 56. Because I have a earlier version. Yeah. <laughs> No. Yes, in in your packet is the previous version, so that's oh not the, oh okay. that's not the most recent one. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to assume that that was fifty. Sorry, I should have clarified that. So yeah. the um, the EV charging facility is in the upper right hand corner. So we've got one in the upper left hand corner, where you know, adjacent to the to the. Um, Berkshire Brewing property, right. Oh, sorry, left. I don't know my left from my right. I apologize. And then it was also just indicating the existing EV spaces. Yes, over. On the right hand, on the eastern part of the right. site. Yeah. Um, we are providing, you know, part of the design intent is with that larger rain garden directly behind um, those residential units, correct? Um, that that's planted and, and landscaped in a way that provides some some privacy, some um, you know, some private area on between that and the building, um, so that you know, just in in recognition of of you know that resident, uh, you know, the need for some outdoor space there, um, in previous discussion. So um, through a series of you know, um, you know, hedge type plantings and and um, plants appropriate for for a rain garden, the idea is to provide that sort of separation there. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, if Chris, you want to talk to, to some of the MVP grant requirements and uh, associated elements as part of this, um, just because I know that was, um, you know, a, a key instrument in this in this um, project. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so the good news is that... Uh, oh, we... Chris, can you just introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Chris Curtis. Um, I'm the town's uh, municipal vulnerability preparedness consultant. Thank you, Chris. So um, again, the good news on this project is that we applied for an MVP action grant this year and, and, and did receive it. So we have funding to cover the cost of most of the green components of this project, um, which takes you know, some of the budget burden off the town for, for this. So the things that are included in the grant are um, two rain gardens, two tree box filters, one bioswale, and then we also had um, some educational signage, which we need to think about yeah. including um, that would basically explain how the the green infrastructure stormwater components of the project work, um, perhaps similar to the signs that you've seen for the tree box filters in the center of town. Um, picnic tables, there were two of those that were, um, there are funds that were donated as a match by local businesses. So we have local business involvement in this already. And then a couple of bike racks that the town was going to provide as a match from your, I think there's some existing that. Yeah, we uh, have some in storage, I think. Right. So altogether, there's um, roughly $70,000 in funds for the construction component. And then there's another 25000 for construction oversight to pay for some of the um, engineering costs. So that, again, takes a chunk of that off of your table um, to to uh, help with that that piece of it. Uh, that's wonderful. I um, what trees were you going to suggest? I mean, we, are we? I mean, I hate to get down to the nitty gritty already, but you know, we did have a tree um, audit, mm -hmm. and our tree belts are really healthy, but they are predominantly uh, maples which are not uh, climate change 
uh, resilient for the going forward. So we're trying to diversify our tree belts and anything we plant uh, with more climate resilient plant, uh, trees. And we have been working with the conservation district, Franklin Conservation District to um, make sure that any shrubbery that we plant is non-invasive, but also has a component for habitat for, you know, songbirds and um, pollinators. And then also any native plant, uh, any plants that we plant, perennial plants, be yeah. um, pollinator friendly uh, as well and, and be, you know, not only uh, able to suck up a lot more water than normal in our rain gardens, but you know, to um, generate habitat as well. So we do have kind of a list of plants I would hope that we would work off of and shrubberies. And then there's, you know, choice of trees, but the, you know, the choice should not be maples, even though I love, everybody loves maples. It's not anything against maples, but we really need to make sure that we don't have trees that are gonna be dead in the next 20 or 30 years. Yeah, understood. No, and I think, um, and again, yeah, tonight was really just to sort of hone okay. in on some of those details and discussions. Um, you know, we haven't developed a specific planting palette yet, but, um, you know, my my sort of go-to, I think, in light of everything you said, which has really been, you know, a, a focus of, you know, our efforts as a firm in general over, you know, a, a broad array of projects. But, um, you know, Black Tupelo comes to mind, um, River Birch comes to mind, um, there are yellow woods. There's a couple of other, um, you know, native trees that offer a lot of, you know, um, you know, spring flower value as well as fall color, but also are well suited to, you know, sort of the floodplain yep. environment, which, um, you know, again, this is periodic inundations of water that, you know, that they thrive in sort of similar to a willow, um, a willow just it wouldn't be a great, you know, great tree right. for this location, but um, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, okay. Um, and then similar with, uh, with the rain gardens, absolutely. Yeah, everything would be native, um, non-invasive obviously. Um, and I think, yeah, trying to maximize, um, you know, some of the benefits, some of the plants offer, um, you know, uh, winterberry comes to mind, um, and lank here, uh, shadbush, um, you know, there's a number of trees that, um, you know, are, are pretty uh, standard New England staple, um, that yeah. offer, you know, habitat value, um, you know, ornamental value, um, and I think would, you know, would thrive in a location like Perfect. that. So, yeah. Like I said, we, there's been a lot of research done in, in the town in different little grants and stuff mm. that we've had. And, um, so I just want to make sure that that's not Absolutely. overlooked. And I, I echo your, your sentiment yeah. about the maples, the loss of the maples in the New England, oh, yeah. you know, countryside is, is devastating to see. So yeah, it's yeah. stuff. So I, I noticed mm -hmm. um, the perimeter has sidewalk in all along the front of the Berkshire Brewing property, and then it crosses the parking lot. Do you have any idea about, you know, um, some Northampton, I think, Amherst, they have brick yes yeah. so yeah some of this so yeah if you want to advance to the next slide chris um well what before you leave this just because there is an image in the lower left hand corner um this is should be a discussion topic for tonight and it's related to storm water or something that chris and i have been going back and forth with also um that um you know so a standard a typical parking lot that you'd see in any you know sort of conventional parking area that's paved with blacktop um, if this were a new parking lot, it's it would be designed to go through a number of um, uh, catchment um, elements. So catch basin is one, a rain garden, tree box filters, all of these, you know, collect that water. To meet the current stormwater standards, um, which, you know, we certainly intend to comply with, um, there are two, two um, elements that need to be um, uh, sort of adhered to. So there's a stormwater quality element that so it's cleaning the stormwater before we release it. And then there's a, a attenuation, a storage issue. So um, the, the premise is that, you know, runoff coming off a site in a current condition um, won't be exceeded in the proposed condition. So what often results is, you know, a big detention basin to hold, you know, what the hundred year storm is the standard and that the, the rainfall amounts that you use for that benchmark have been increased. So, you know, 
understandably it's it's you know it's a fair volume of water mm -hmm. um um so and we've got to do that for the 10 20 25 and 100 year storm and that's we've got to balance all of those pre and post rate and so with a conventional parking lot on an undeveloped site what you often end up with is a large subsurface system to hold that water and it would run through you know these rain gardens these bio swill swales uh, tree box filters, that's a that's a treatment mechanism. So we would achieve all the stormwater quality we would with those features, but then we still need to store that water. And so on this site, we have two real, we have two options, two viable options. One is to do, you know, a, a sort of a conventional system, which we absolutely can do, um, which would mean because of the constraints of this site, something below the parking lot. So you wouldn't see it. It would be a storage, you know, it would be large pipes and stone um, to store, you know, what we need to before releasing it somewhere. Um, it's certainly, you know, it's just a numbers thing. It's it's easy. It costs money to put it in the ground, um, maintain it. Um, but it's it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. And it's what most people are used to seeing. The other option is porous asphalt. And I recognize there was some, you know, complications with the previous grant. Outside of the green infrastructure component of it, while I, though I would consider it, you know, a, a, a green, you know, an element, a green, a green feature, um, exclusive of that, it is a viable stormwater management um, tool um, and and um, and strategy. And we had well, we did the test bit um, digs out here to understand where seasonal high groundwater is, and I think initially we were anticipating that it was going to be much higher and much worse soils than it is. It's actually pretty sandy soil and groundwater in this particular site is, is you know, fair way down. And so um, to do a porous asphalt um, system here actually works out pretty well. There's a little bit of extra depth that you've got to excavate to fill with stone. It's, it is just stone, um, but then you put a, you know, porous asphalt surface over the top of it and pave it just like you would a normal lot. Uh, normal asphalt, it just has voids in the in the stone. So um, uh, there are several examples in the valley. I think you know, just thinking about some of the conversations from the previous meetings about um, you know both the heat island effect, the idea that it's not asphalt, it's something else, and then you know the grass pave concept um, all have uh, maintenance implications. Um, but porous is a little bit softer to look at, I guess, if that's a right way to describe it. You know, it looks um, it looks like a stabilized gravel parking area, um, but it was it it is it is capable of taking all the rainwater that you put on it um, and storing it. We can still include and direct water from adjacent sites, from gravel lots, you know, behind behind those buildings that that front on Elm Street and, and drain to the back, we can capture that water in these bio swales and the rain gardens. So they're still functional and and still, you know, viable mm -hmm. elements. But um, I did want to just offer up the notion of porous asphalt again, because it would be a real good fit for this site. Um, so um, can I just ask, because, um, you know, it's so positive with the drainage there already in the in the and the level of the water. What's the longevity of porous asphalt versus anything else? If it's put down correctly, it lasts as long as a typical asphalt it parking lot. So right. it's 10, 12, you know, or more years. Yeah. Okay. 15 years. Yep. yep. Tim, did you have a question? Oh, I was just gonna say, um, what's the offset for putting in all the piping infrastructure versus just putting in gravel and covering it with the porous surface? Sure. Um I, we haven't, I don't have any, you know, real current cost data. What I will say is um, locally stone materials aggregate, especially in this area, are pretty cheap. So yes, there's a trucking cost. It's more of that material, but that is a material is very cheap compared to plastic pipes that need to be shipped in from Ohio and, you know, out of, out of the New England region, because that's where it's made. That's where you have to get the stuff. Mm -hmm. There is still some aggregate. Um, I think part of the sort of life cycle costs deal with uh, maintenance. Um, those subsurface systems do require a fair amount of maintenance. Um, you know, they, um, you know, particularly with the rain gardens, um, they really, you know, there is a maintenance program that if, if all of the water is going through those 
elements, just like a catch basin. They've got to be inspected, you know, at least once a year, be, you know, vacuumed out. They've got to be, you know, maintained. And then there's, you know, the maintenance associated with the larger subsurface system. Um, the other trick here is um, just to not, not to diverge, but is what we do with the overflow water. Um, we would often tie into, you know, an adjacent municipal system. Um, we don't have the ability to go to North Main Street because it's DOT controlled. So that's off the table. It's going to be real hard pressed to get something to, to the system in Elm Street. I think we might be able to do it, but um, I think just what it means is because it's such a long way to get there that, you know, we've got to keep our system really shallow and it's just, it would be, you know, it would consume a large portion of the site if that makes sense because we don't have the help the depth mm -hmm. um wow it sounds like poor i mean so in other words if you had to keep the pipes high up we'd have site it, right so that they could slope down down to help yeah. um, that that would be a problem exactly right yeah. it's, it's not a problem it just means no. that you're it's you're a constraint a much yeah. bigger right it's a it's a much bigger constraint yes so um porous asphalt um it it you know technically they say it requires a vacuum truck once a year um, we've seen several parking lots that have been had um, maintenance in, um, you know, four or five years. The key is that you really can't sand and salt it. Um, sand is really the, the the biggest, you know, the biggest enemy. Um, you know, salt will dissipate, but um, most, you know, most municipalities aren't using salt now any anyway. So um, as long as you know you're not sanding it, um, the, the the little bit of sediment that is collected on it, um, you know. They they fun they exceed their functionality. Porous paving paving exceeds its functionality at ninety percent uh, or eighty percent clogged. Uh, if that so, with eighty percent of that surface completely clogged, it still exceeds its functional you know capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so if that you know, um, my my next question would be just what you said. Um, we miss municipalities, unfortunately, can't, with climate change, have to treat more. Mm -hmm. So what's the treatment for porous asphalt that um, would work? In the and, in the winters? Yeah. So, I mean, the two things I will say is, you know, the, the standard is sort of a liquid applied, you know, de-icer. You know, a lot of, a lot of okay. you know, towns and, and companies offer that now as, a, as an alternative. Um, the other thing that is unique about porous is it actually um, thaws quicker than traditional asphalt. Um, you know, traditional asphalt is, is, if you can imagine those piles, that snow as it thaws out, all that water then has to run underneath the snow to go somewhere. So those piles tend to stay there a little bit longer. With porous, all of that just seeps into the ground. Okay. And so it actually you know tends to disappear a little bit faster. That makes um, sense because I, I, I can't. If we're going to have a viable parking lot, I cannot imagine that we wouldn't want to treat it. Yep. Um, okay. And you yeah, would I mean, uh, it if, just like you would any yeah. other lot. So oh, yes. I'm... The liquid stuff, um, that's when, when you go out and look at five and 10 and you see these little stripes going down it, that's, they've sprayed that's, it. Yes. So, yeah. What they're trying to do is come up with um, an alternative to salt. Right. Because the salt, everybody is treating so much salt that you're making... Like salt marshes, salt, salt marshes, which are mm. habitats for bad mosquitoes. So, um, so we're trying to find alternatives. It's just it's more expensive. Than so, do, did I hear you correct correctly to say, obviously, traditional asphalt has a price per whatever, mm -hmm. however they price it. What's the price differential? It, so you pay the the. Rule of thumb in the past has been, um, you know, it's maybe a third more expensive to install a porous asphalt parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was sort of the rule of thumb several years ago. I think costs have come up enough with the stormwater you know, stuff systems. and infrastructure that, you know, it's it's not quite that, um, you know, drastic anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, the lifespan and functionality of a porous asphalt, you know, over the long term is, is far less um, than a, a typical parking lot. Excellent. All right. Um, you want to? Yeah. I, well, I was just going to mention um, we have a porous uh, parking lot um, just on the Waitley town line off of Route 5 and 10 that 
is a pretty good example of, of one locally. Um, yeah. I think in that case, they used a mix of, of porous pavement for the parking spaces mm -hmm. and regular um, asphalt for the driving lanes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's another alternative. Um, might be a possibility, but it gives you more runoff. So yeah, and then and the trick is that cross section technically is a little bit different. You know, you could put traditional asphalt on top of a deeper stone bed, but it's um yeah. So it. Uh, so what's the interface like though? Right? Well, that, and that's why it just it gets tricky. Yes. Yeah. So the you know. So a really good installer could do a great job, but somebody who's not really familiar with it might not do a great job. Right. And it's, and generally as a rule of thumb, you know, to have one consistent material throughout as, you know, as one application and one maintenance regime mm -hmm. tends to make more sense. It does make more sense. So, I don't want to complicate right. the situation already. Mm -hmm. I did just see, it looks like Kevin had his hand up. I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry, Kevin. You can't really see. Uh, That's okay. I, I got out just a couple of quick things. Um, Tim, just so you're aware when, when, when they talk about the, like the, the pencil marks going down the road on like five and 10 and stuff, yep. that, what that is, that that's a brine. Okay. So it's, it's a water salt mix and what it is, it's applied and then it dries And the thought process is when it starts to snow that reactivates that what little bit of salt is there. What that's designed to do is stop the bonding because, you know, like, you know, like right. you ever gone over an area where, where the snow is just like absolutely packed on the pavement, no matter what they do, that's bonding. That's what you're trying to do. What I'm concerned about is, is, is can I use traditional salt on this? The, obviously the concrete areas, you know, where I've got my sidewalks, I will do the same thing like I do, um, at like town hall, um, which is a different, uh, just a different chemical that we use or a different product. Um, but can I use standard sand or excuse me, not sand, but standard salt on this thing? Actually, it's a treated salt is what we use. Sure. Or do I have to go ahead and come up with a whole new system to take care of this parking lot is my question. No. So these, so porous asphalt can be salted. It's yeah, it's really the aggregate, the fines that right. you're worried about clogging, you know, the pore space. So it, as salt dissolves and dissipates, it's, you know, generally that's fine. It just because of the conversation, it made it sound like we weren't going to use salt. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was fully aware that that would be my intention at this point, unless I was directed to do elsewise. Otherwise, you have all faith in you, Kevin, that you can come up yeah. with new solutions to this future we're moving into. But it's good to know that salt works too. Well, what I'm what I'm concerned about, I just need to make sure that you know if I need to change up what I got to do, I need to know. You know, um, I can do anything. You give me enough money. I can do anything, but ah. you got to give me the money. So that's all I'm going to say on our part. So when they're talking about the maintenance and things like that, we need to make sure that within my budget that these okay. things are thought about because this may not be something. And I'm not sure because I honestly don't know how to clean out a, a rain garden or, or a bioswale. Um, you know, is this something that, you know, is something fairly simple that we can handle or is this something where it's a service that that somebody goes out and provides? Um, for the environmental areas, I, I'm not, I'll be honest with you, I'm really not sure. sure. Um, but again, you know, if it's something that that's going to involve more with with the highway, then we just need to make sure that budget wise, we're well aware of that all of these things need to be added to addressed. So, that's all. Thank you. So, yeah, and in you know, respect to maintenance, you know, we would include a maintenance program. You know, our goal is to make these as as um, as simple as possible because we totally recognize the the constraints that everybody is working under. Um, and so, um, you know, in the areas that are planted, um, you know, while it is a rain garden, it is a, you know, landscaped area. So it's really just mostly about the plant identification and understanding, you know, what's, what's desirable and what isn't. And the areas that, um, you know, receive the most um, abuse would be, you know, reinforced with stone or some other material that, um, you know, made it obvious what 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 needed to be taken care of. Um, so that would be the Kevin, yeah. we do have um, uh, Franklin Conservation District has a grant for us to um, do the buffer in, in native plant, you know, do training with the highway department on how to maintain um, a buffer along the bloody brook. And okay, to cool plant that so i'm sure we could 
incorporate the training because it's a consultant that works with us to do the training. So they could take the training manual or the manual that from this, you know, the parking lot and incorporate that in the training. It's really, I, I, I agree. It's more like plant identification because once native plants are established, it's, it's just, you know, you don't want to pull them up. That's all. You know, so it's a more identification. No, very good. So how much more of your presentation do you have? Because we've been interrupting you a lot. So if, no, that's if, fine. I think a few more slides, I think, highlight some of the other details that I'd just like to, you know, um, you know, I, we've sort of covered some of the plant discussions. Um, I think, you know, part of the goal of this, and I just bring this slide with a with a common project that we had been involved with several years ago is Part of what we our, our goal is, at least for for the town, is to develop a a language with some of the furnishings and and you know site elements. So some of the benches, some of the you know light fixture, some of that style is uh, was a lot of the conversation that happened around the common. And so you know I didn't want to dismiss that effort in those you know that um, those discussions. And so you know you can go a little bit further, Chris, but just the idea that that style of of bench is what gets incorporated into some of these, um, you know, some of these seating areas and some of these sort of plaza areas um, mm -hmm. in, in and around the Leary lot. Um, we had spoken about, um, you know, distinguishing the pedestrian routes with, um, you know, a brick edging, a brick banding, and, you know, again, to, to have something that was um, a little bit more um, distinguishable for Deerfield um, was, was a conversation. So that's something that we wanted to introduce again. And the idea, um, if you want to scroll down a little bit, uh, Chris, um, that there are some brick, um, you know, highlights, um, you know, in banding in some of the plazas, um, just to differentiate, you know, different different sections. Um, the idea that um, maybe there's a small seat wall um, at that corner as you cross to to the brewery as just a way to um, draw attention and a little bit of focus in that at that intersection, that junction. Um, and it's different than a bench. Um, we can put some plants in it. it. It invites a different kind of gathering, different type of interaction. Um, um, you know, granite or stone. You know benches or walls, that type of material yeah. choice. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> maybe. The computer's thinking about it. Okay, there we go. Um, and again, just thinking about, um, yeah, both these, um, you know, you were asking about the crosswalks. I think that's probably a little bit further down, but yeah, they, um, you know, picnic tables, um, tree filters, how we, you know, engage that that stormwater in, in, uh, in, in elegant ways to bring that into these bioswales and the rain gardens, um, again, with with brick banding um, and some granite, um, you know, some more natural materials. I think most of the furnishings that we have looked at um, exclusive from the, of the benches have some wood type um, of material. Um, it could be a composite, but the idea that, um, you know, it's a, it's a softer material, it's not all metal, it's, you know, maybe there's some metal um, detailing or incorporated, you know, foundation, but that, that it's a sort of more natural, um, softer material. Um, <clears throat> and that would, that would, um, you know, play out in the picnic benches, the, the, um, you know, any waste receptacles, if there's a need for any, um, and then obviously the, the standalone benches. Um, I, I, I know Kate Lawless is on, I saw her before the, um, slides came up. Kate, did you have any questions about how much we were going to be able to bleed over into the common while we're still waiting for mass DOT? Is she still on? Can you see? I can't see if she's there. No, it looks like she's not on the participant list anymore. Oh, okay. Um, Ju uh, who's on the participant list? Did Julie, do you have any questions? Oh, I always have questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so from the finance committee, at, um, are there annual costs or periodic costs? It sounds like an occasional vacuuming of the porous concrete. Um, there's some sort of 
fee associated with the EV spots? Um, are there any other like maintenance costs or anything else that we should be thinking about? I mean, the only things I would see is just maintenance of, you know, some of those plaza areas. I don't know what's, you know, whether there's, you know, trash pickup or just, the, you know, what kind of typical maintenance would be required for those. But um, aside from general landscape maintenance, I wouldn't see any other, um, any other real maintenance needs beyond what you just explained. Okay. Um, Chris, could you talk about the... Um the current understanding of the EV um, costs and, and the benefits we get from the solar solar fields that exist and the payments they give the town? Happily. So um, I've done a little bit of research because the question was posed to me how much the current EV charger that we have at the intersection of where the Leary lot currently exists and North Main Street, um, how much that's costing the town just to operate from an electrical perspective. Um, and the good news is since we were able to drop that demand charge from Eversource back in July, we haven't had to pay them a single bill because the credit is greater than the amount we're being billed. And the credit is what we get from the solar field that we're part of an aggregation for that's up on 901 River Road. Um, so that's a really promising sign, I personally think, um, that we we haven't had to pay a bill since then. Um, if anything, we might want to consider bringing that credit down a little bit, which would need to be reallocated, but that's going to be something I work on um, with Eversource in the near future. Um, that actually, I think, poses the question of how much we're currently charging for that for the use of that existing charger and whether we would want to consider maybe lowering that a bit because we get paid through ChargePoint, who operates the charger. Um, and if we're bringing in an unreasonable amount of money compared to what it actually cost us to operate that charger, we might be just doing ourselves a disservice by scaring people away from it when there are less expensive or even free chargers elsewhere in the area like Yankee Candle and Treehouse. Mm -hmm. um, so I sent the board an email earlier today kind of concerning that. Um, and that's something that I think we're going to be looking into in the near future, even if we don't have any concrete solutions or recommendations tonight. Yeah, so I just just because I was driving yesterday and I had to use a charger since I usually just charge at home um, with my solar panels. Uh, I was, I think I was in Hartford and I plugged in and it was 41 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, are we currently charging 70? 75. Right. And the reason why we were doing that was because the de demand charge was so high and we had these fees we were worried about. So we do really need to do an analysis of what's the, what's the best cost because apparently um, if you use a lot of chargers you go online and it says don't go to Deerfield they charge 70 cents a kilowatt hour um, so is 30 cents the right one number is you know we need to we need to do some research on that but we want to encourage people to use the infrastructure it's going to be there well we would have to recalculate I mean Chris if you could recalculate now that the demand charge is gone, mm -hmm. if you can recalculate what would be a reasonable charge, yeah, we should review that pretty fast, actually, because we don't want people online to think that we're charging too much. And if right. there's if there's a if there's a, a volume component, like if we use if people use them ten times more often than they currently use them, does that you know does that take care of whatever charge that we're getting? Um, so that we could lower it and encourage usage. Sure. I'll do some research on that in the coming week and get back to the board and hopefully have an update by our meeting next Wednesday. Right. I just, cause Julie is correct. We should be charging, you know, make sure we're not having a cost to the town, but on the other hand, there's no, you know, we should have it adjusted mm -hmm. now that we got that demand charge dropped. Okay, good. Um, Julie, uh, Julie still has her hand raised. Oh, no, sorry, was... Julie, go ahead. Just one more question. The location of the picnic benches, um, did you all look at different spots for that? Because it's going to be pretty much between two parking lots, right? It is, although that's, you know, I mean, other we have very limited space on the north side of the, of the lot. Um, and in any of the islands, you know, the other islands or opportunities, I would say that it's it's a very similar situation that it's it's sort of between, you know, between parking areas or, or you know, areas used mostly by vehicles. Um, 
this one particular spot seemed to be appropriate because it was closest to the market because it was mm -hmm. yeah, um, good point. had a little bit more you know green space around it compared to just further west um and you know we had we had some opportunity to create a you know a bigger plaza there but um you know we can certainly look at other alternatives did you look at uh, putting a trash can anywhere although that would have to be emptied periodically right so no i mean we are showing you know uh, that as a you know furnishing option or consideration this is certainly a location i would you know consider but again it's a municipal maintenance question really is is yeah. that they want to do <clears throat> i think it looks lovely chris go ahead you had a question um yeah if we could go back to the overall design plan i just had a question about the layout mm -hmm. um so i'm thinking about you know we just have been begun talking about the tree box filters mm -hmm. and where they might be located if in the upper in the upper right hand corner of the design at um, main street is there the possibility of having room for a tree box filter there because the advantage to it would be that it might capture some of the runoff from main street as well if it could i don't know if the grades would work or not sure we can uh, certainly look at locating one on the yeah sort of on the the right side as you enter into the parking lot off of North Main. Yeah. So we can, yeah, the grades would be the tricky thing, but um, we could certainly look at doing something there. I know there's also some underground utilities there that come through. So I didn't need to. There are. We ran into that when yeah. we were trying to locate a tree box filter on Main Street. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're able to move it off the street, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll miss those lines sure. primarily. Yep. So then the other location, you know, is kind of to be determined as well, I guess. Um, I'm thinking, um, you know, down at the far end, um, upper, you know, upper left hand mm -hmm. corner might be another possibility. But yeah, yeah. And any of those, you know, you'll see there's a couple that we had, you know, thought about um, just uh, adjacent to that picnic, that picnic area. There's a couple of is the, the little bit of a um, area there that show, sort of showed up in that um, the previous slide. But those, you know, that's another area similar to what you were just talking about um, in the upper left, you know, we could do do something similar to there. So there's, yeah, there's definitely places and flexibility with, with those filters, yeah. Um, the other question is um, schedule. Um, I just wanted to note that on the MVP grant, we have um, until June of 2024 to complete all of the work on the project and i know schedules tend to slide on things like this what what are you thinking at this point um i think june is very doable i think the key would be you know obviously i don't i don't foresee this all getting you know or getting started this year i think it would be um something that you would want to certainly have um bid plans ready for um, you know, it was early in the winter and, and sent out to contractors, you know, around then to get, you know, the best pricing possible and, and set it up with them such that, you know, it is among the first projects that they start in the spring. Um, there's no reason that this, you know, shouldn't take more than a month to do. Um, so I think there's, there's a window, definitely a, a big window there of opportunity. I think it's just making sure that we have a contractor lined up and a, a, a contract awarded, um, you know, sometime down the road. So if, if we were to try and do something this year, when would we need to break ground? Could we do it in October? Could we do it in potentially late October, early November? Uh, potentially. Yeah. I think, you know, my concern would be, you know, us finalizing a, a, you know, public bid ready set, right. Um, getting that, you know, on the, on the, um, in, you know, advertisements and, and right. register and just given those timelines, there's probably a month of bidding and, Right. Um, just thinking about negotiation and contract award and most contractors, um, you know, site guys aren't really thinking about, you know, taking on opening up, you know, new yeah. projects this right. time of year. Okay. Um, I can think would be my, and I think you'd probably get a much better price for, you know, work next year and work that they know they can start the season with versus trying when, to when squeeze we, in, you know, something at the end of this season. When would we put out the RFPs? For I think that could be done in December, December? January. Okay. Yeah. So we we'd we'd basically have a couple of months in the winter to let the bid process come in and and then award a contract, work out the details, and right. then 
they just hit the ground. Right. And I think, you know, I think we, one of the, one of the key, um, key elements I think would just be specifying what the expectation with the expected schedule is and just making that clear in the, mm-hmm. in the, in the contract and the specifications. But yeah, I don't think there's any reason why. I, I actually want to keep pushing on this because. Yeah. Oh, I have no problem with pushing. Okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to yep. push it off I, the next I'm year. Not, I'm not saying that. I mean, I'm really disappointed because I was hoping to get it done before the snow flies. Yep. But and I, I, maybe we can. I like I said, I will, yeah. my goal will be. I think is you know as we get these answers to the porous or not, and some of those things that um, mm-hmm. you know we can. You know, we've got our we've got most of our stormwater modeling done. We've got most of um, you know our sheets ready to go. It's it's really you know we've got maybe a week's worth of work to finalize everything. Um, there's no reason, um, I know we've got site plan review and planning board to go to, um, it's not uncommon for, you know, particularly with some of these municipal projects to have those two efforts going concurrently. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if if you don't anticipate any issues with, with site plan and and approval. And if, if we were to decide that we were going to go the, you know, the porous pavement route, would that eliminate some work that you have to do? Or if we if we wanted to know what's the cost of the traditional method and what's the cost of this? Yep. Um, I'm just trying to figure out. I mean, we could certainly get you some some estimate of cost mm-hmm. if um if that would be helpful and and you know I, mean, I think I, it would because I, we we need to consider. Yep. I mean, I'm I'm right now I'm really leaning towards the porous pavement. Yep. Because um <clears throat> You know, having a system underground is just asking for issues. Yep. And I think the trade off, I mean, we really want to make everything as green as possible and, and as most resilient moving forward. If we if it gets inundated with water, this is a system that would recover faster. Yes. Um, and and I have been going to these conferences, you know, that I'm going to next week that have been very successful. In uh, you know northern New England mm. areas, so mm. we need to like bite the bullet and and put it in so that we yep. have a long term resilient parking lot. And and just uh, again, just as an advocate for the use of porous um, in a resiliency sense, um, you know one of the things that I really like about it, as I was speaking to before is that you know even when it's eighty percent clogged, it still functions, but the system as a whole is is you know it's got more capacity than than you know you would possibly design in a conventional system um you know thinking about these storms that you know exceed the 100 year storm on a much more regular basis this this would have no problem handling that uh, type of water. and and that's what i feel like we have to do yeah because mm-hmm. you know we're having 500 year storms yeah. every two or three years right. Right. <laughs> at this rate that's right. happening I mean, and this if is my third. There's a way to contain third. that on-site and not push off that right. that burden to other municipal systems or resource areas. Um, well, a butters like a, because and a butters, right? We need to take a butters water if if the if yep. what's happening is happening. Um, we have to have the ability for extra capacity somewhere. Yep. And this is key to the you know to our start of the revitalization downtown. And I so. But we can certainly provide a cost. I think yeah. that, would, yes. that you would be, you know, you would, you would, it would. It would be make us feel better. I efficient. think with the choice, if we, if we had some idea of the cost. So realistically, we we have a select board meeting every two weeks, um, and um, so need that cost estimate before then. So it can be digested because obviously if we have to make a decision about porous versus conventional, we need to give you that as soon as possible for you to try to get us, as Carolyn says, breaking ground before the end of the year. So we can, I can commit to getting that to you, you know, within the next few days. Excellent. Be early you. next week, but I, I will yeah. prioritize that work to get to you. Yes. And, and I'm with Carolyn. I'm, I'm leaning at this point. I think porous when you think about it every inch of the surface is letting water go into the ground as opposed to everything running into one place going into a system that's highly engineered yep. it gets filled up it doesn't drain out um so um i know it's, it's i know it's failure. difficult for 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 you know folks who have worked you know a whole career in the conventional world to to start saying okay we need to transition to what's the future 
Um, but this is a very low speed area. So it's not like a highway where you're traveling at 70, 80 miles an hour and uh, the road surface is not going to take the beating it's going to, that a highway would. So. Um, so you're not going to be able to drive through the street. Oh, sure you will. Yes, that's just it. Yeah, this all that's intended to show is that there's a a surface material there that indicates a it's a pedestrian walk. It would be a a crosswalk. I've got a, a image in a future slide of um you know what you were talking about. Yes, yes. So it would be like the brick. You know, a, a brick a inlay brick, or something, right? Yeah, something that connotates this is where you walk. This is a crosswalk. You know, you got to be careful. You know, pass uh, pedestrians have right away that kind of thing. That would be the idea. Yes, that that it's a consistent material. Chris, can you go to back to the um, uh, slide that had the um, picture of the sidewalk? Mm -hmm. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, actually, there's a, yeah. Yeah, so that's the idea is that, you know, whether it be concrete or brick, you know, but that that there's a defined pedestrian path that is consistent throughout, but it's certainly drivable. Yeah, and it's it's the same level as the surface right. of the. Yeah, right. Um. So yeah, I don't know, and and so um, just other slides, um, and just topics. Um, yeah, so we spent some time on this. So the next one I think was, um, speaking to, yeah, the character of the rain guards and just, again, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a more diverse plant selection, um, uh, more native, um, you know, using, uh, sort of more natural wash stone as opposed to crushed aggregate, um, in areas particularly that, that, um, need to absorb, you know, some more of that stormwater inundation and, um, you know, um, you know, one of the things that we've certainly learned over the years in doing these is um, the original rain gardens were these big basins filled with mulch. And as soon as they filled up, all the mulch would flow it away. And so, um, you know, as we've learned a lot over the years. And, and so trying to minimize that type of um, that type of stuff certainly makes maintenance easier. Yeah, is what I will say. Um, is there just, is there any advantage in, in the porous pavement? Does does that still go through like a stormwater management um, process? So, it, I mean, it does. It's, it's, yeah. the, the, that's the other intriguing thing about the forest is that um, that it also achieves all the stormwater quality um, requirements that are, you know, would be required as of, of a conventional parking lot. So, you know, particularly with the sediment removal um, and pollutant removal, um, a lot of that is is get gets captured in that porous. Um, and because there are so many void space, there's such a capacity there to absorb that sediment without losing functionality. Um, you, you know, the beauty of porous is that you can do porous asphalt, achieve all your stormwater volume and your stormwater quality um, requirements in, in one fell swoop. So um, again, just a strong advocate for it. When you went out and did the, you know, the, the testing on the site, um, my concern was that because it's an undeveloped site, it was also a receiving area. Did you look at the calculations as if it was a receiving area um, when you were doing the stormwater? Um, in terms of receiving, you well, mean from like the a, budding space, a the budding... watershed that is draining to it. Yes. So when we when we do our stormwater calculations, we certainly look at the larger watershed because we don't want to 
you know, draw an imaginary boundary to, around the property because that's not reality. You know, right. the, it's stormwater flows in and stormwater flows out. And so having a really good understanding of that is, you know, really where we start. Um, so yes, we did. Okay. Take Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure if, if we were taking water from abutting sites already, yeah. that that was in the calculation. And just again, it's what I was speaking to before about the location of that bioswale. So, you know, that would extend off the sort of that right leg um, of that larger rain garden, the upper left-hand corner, but grade wise, you know, part of what we're trying to do is use that as an opportunity to capture some of the runoff that's coming from those gravel lots and those other lots just to the south that abut because those don't have, you know, those have no stormwater controls or management in them now. So this was an opportunity to improve what's there and utilize, you know, Perfect. this project okay. as a way to improve that. So that was, you know, again, we thought as a win-win. Um, so then, yeah, I think, that is there one more slide or is this, this may be it. Looks like this is the last this one. It. Okay, so yes, this is, um, so I think, yeah, I, I, again, we talked about plantings um, and, uh, you know, just material um, thoughts with, with some of the amenities, the wood and sort of softer materials. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, you know, using brick certainly as, as accents and natural stone wherever we can. Um, and then, um, um, yeah, some, some uh, seat walls, some, some other seating um, opportunities um, seem okay. like a, a, a you know a, a nice suggestion and an element to add here. So I think that was the as long as we get everybody's buy in on that, that we can yeah move ahead. Perfect. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, could you go back to the slide? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, it's up yeah. to the town, but I can I can print this presentation out and hand you a copy for sure. Yep. Um, also, my copy is that the and the Uh, the, the road coming out to Elm Street and a nice green buffer for the tenants that they don't keep um, hear the cars keep on going. I see that there's plenty of green on the left hand side. Can we take some more of that green and put it on the right side of the so Jeff, just since we haven't finalized how wide that's going to be, that's one of the final questions we have. Is it a two lane? Is it a one lane? Is it going to have a sidewalk next to it? Is it not going to have a sidewalk next to it? Um, when you're thinking about that, Jeff, and when we get you the information about um, how much knowing that Hampshire Lumber plans to build a building very close to the edge of the property, um what what are the constraints with right. the placement of the roadway yeah so yeah i think that certainly we'll have to really understand you know and whatever absolutely whatever green space we can dedicate um you know there's there's going to be an emergency access you know width that we need to maintain but whether that gets a little bit wider we can accommodate a sidewalk and a and a you know and a, a hedge or some sort of buffer um we'll we'll certainly look at that yeah is there um in a two-lane road is there a minimum distance of the size of the lane is it 10 feet is it um drive lanes are yeah usually Nine, between 10, 10, and 12 10 and 12 feet wide um you know it's not uncommon for a two-way street to be 16 feet wide it's you know for something that doesn't get you know frequent two-way traffic um you know 18 feet is usually a little bit more comfortable and as far as like emergency use i mean an 18 foot two-lane road uh wouldn't stop a fire truck from going down it and going into the parking lot uh, I'm just trying to get all the legal 
questions. Yeah, eight, I mean, eighteen to twenty feet is usually for you know usually it's what's required for for fire. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as as long as we've got eighteen feet clear usually, and they have room for outriggers, you know, to put those down, um, that's usually adequate. Um, so that's again, that's just what where our, our recommendation for an eighteen foot road started with mm -hmm. in the beginning, just thinking that that's enough for emergency. You could do two way if you needed to functions very well as one and it really doesn't take up any more room than you would otherwise need but um you know we'll certainly look at that i think one of the biggest thing is this would be really just cars and i mean like you said it would be wide enough for emergency but there are no like big trucks coming down and that makes a big difference uh you know in people's perception of you know how much space they have yes if you have a big truck coming next to you, it's pretty scary in a, that tight space. Okay. Is there anybody, does anybody else have one, any more questions? Um, what I'm thinking of is having one more meeting uh, with the final, final design. Uh, I mean, when we get the pricing or. Um, you know, we don't need a specific meeting. We could just put it on the agenda as part of our select board meeting or open our meeting up at 5.30 and so that people could. We've had consistent viewership from uh, at least two people. Yes. Um, <laughs> how are you feeling from the beginning of the process to the, to this point on what you've seen? We moved in the right direction? And making this a pleasant area and improving old Deerfield. Uh, I hope we can continue to improve Elm Street. Well, we're going to try. This is <laughs> why we keep pushing this because we really, you know, it, I think people will get very excited once this is, you know, we start shoveling the ground and we actually have this project done. I mean, we're ready. And, um, you know, so I th I think I think there will be excitement and people will really feel like we're committed to getting the rest of all these big ideas done. So, I mean, I'm I, that's why mm -hmm. I, I, I understand there was a potentially a price difference. But waiting till spring. But, you know, if you get it, don't get it out there, you don't know. Yep. So, you know, we want to see and um, if there's any possibility Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would love to get this done by Thanksgiving or Christmas. I mean, how exciting. Mm -hmm. You know, but open yeah. up the new year. I just wanted to say I, I really love some of the design details, especially like the brick um, edging and the uh, stone benches. And I think those are uh, maybe a, a theme that could consistently be carried over to Elm Street as well. Um, it really uh, might Street. create a design theme for the town center mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the common I mean we had so much energy for the common and we had such a great committee and everybody's just been like hanging around waiting for mass DOT and it, it just is so frustrating and it's really hard for us because yeah. we've been work. everybody's been coming to meetings and got got going. So if we get this going and we even, if we only bleed over a little bit of the crosswalk on North main street, that is our property, you know, maybe that would give us a little bit of more incentive to get pushed mass DOT to, so that we can get. Also it'd be around. a good thing for mass DOT to see, see how nice our parking lot looks. You're Think committed what to we are, our town yeah. common could look like if you would just get off the dime and figure out how we can do this. Um, you know, because it is a matter of their will as much as it is of our will. Um, and Joe and Natalie have, are a hundred percent committed. They've come to two or three meetings with Mass DOT. So, if we can get this done, that will give Joe and Natalie a little bit more of um, you know help pushing Mass DOT for us. So, I mean, I, I, it's just really exciting to move forward, and we really want to. We want people's input. So that it is as attractive and people feel excited about this as much as we are, actually. Uh, 
appointment. I mean, really, it's, it's not doing things, but what is South Deerfield or Deerfield about? And, and taking those elements into your professions of what you want, you know, the, the lighting, you know, the street lights, everything. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was just going to say. Right. Right. Well, if, you, if people are really trying to are walking our streets, so let's make improve the walkability. Let's improve the social ability. I think we all went through the pandemic where people were, you know, not being able to be social. And so we can be social as in the community, but you need to be safe. You have to be able to walk safely. You need to be able to have a lit space that people feel safe. And then you're going to have the sociability come out. So I, I, and we have to be more resilient. We have to be able to absorb more water. There's just nothing we can do about it. More water is coming. And that if we build things that can take more water, then we will not have to keep replacing things. And in the long run, it will be cheaper because we're not having to keep addressing the repairs. And it's just, you know, things wash out, culverts, you know, get clogged up and blow out, costs us money. It's not in the budget. So if we build this correctly, and that's why I am supportive of the porous um, uh, pavement because it's it's just a simple it absorbs a lot it has the ability to have a lot of capacity but in the long run we we will be building for climate these climate impacts i but what what's important about this design and that was why i double checked with jeff is that your, some of your water now is going onto that site, I'm sure. So we want to make sure the calculations do and you know make sure that's incorporated in the calculations. So it seems like it is. Jeff is aware of that, and um, and if you do pour pavement, then it, it will be okay. We can we can do you know what is extra. Okay. Well, thanks, Jeff. This was very helpful. Thank you, and thank you Chris, exciting. for coming. And thanks, um, Chris. I appreciate it. And um, what I can do is try to get Megan from our conservation district to get you the list of plantings, Jeff. Great. That we've been, you know, we've been researching and promoting. Perfect. Yeah. No, that'd be great. So, do we have any homework for you? Is there anything that we need to? I mean, obviously, if we made the decision porous, that would mean you could just go ahead on that path. But yep. is there anything else that you need I, us to get you by next week? I don't think there's anything specific I need from you. Okay. Um, yeah, like I think I, like I said, I, I, the next step in my eyes would be to get you a, a rough cost um, yep. differential, and then we can move forward from there. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you, your cost estimate, tell us what's the uh, like five year, 10 year, 15 year maintenance of yeah. a traditional system? Yes. Yeah, as we, a, as opposed to one that doesn't have any holes in the ground where stuff's supposed to flow and then it doesn't because it's clogged and yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Chris, again. Oh, you're, you're welcome to stay. I don't know how much business left we have left. But. Um. I think the only thing that we were going to do, well, Chris, I think that was it, right? I think so. I think we we touched on everything else. Um, I don't have an agenda in front of me, so re correct um, me if I'm wrong. No, I'm pretty sure that we're all set. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn, Tim. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I will second that. All those in favor? Tim Hill, G.I. Carolyn Nessai. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.